almost around the game or whatnot, but we've been working for a long, long time in preparation, not only for this game, but for the season, but uh, certainly starts with the University of Florida this coming Saturday. So a uh, great practice this morning. Questions, please. Obviously, you know, not much motivation needed for this matchup, but just how do you make sure you guys go into that game sharp and ready for everything? Well, you know, it's, it's always a great question, right? Because, I mean, motivation in football should always take care of itself. And when you play a, a rivalry game like this, it tends to right, crank up a couple of levels. But I think it's important to always recognize that games like this and games in general are won throughout the off season. They're won in your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday practices. Um, you know, you almost you play the game before you play the game, right? And uh, every block, every tackle, um, certainly the bodies change, right? Uh, and there's always some surprises, but every ounce of focus has to be on the preparation regarding the game. All right, that's how things have the um Without disclosing positions, how how many jobs are you still looking at? Are you are you pretty well set on what's going to happen as far as first twenty two, or is there still some questions? Well, I would say that we certainly know who's going to be playing for us. There's a couple you let out play out throughout the week in terms of who actually gets the first snap or whatnot. But in terms of the roster, the uh, the guys that are actually going to be playing, the guys that have uh, legitimate roles defined, and those that have some reserve roles. That is, for the most part, settled. All right, when you talk about the preparation for this game, part of it obviously is going to be the atmosphere. How do you prepare your team? What do you say to your team? What are the things, obviously, that's something until you get there, it's really hard to present to them. So how do you make sure that they're on the right level to what they're about to see Saturday afternoon? Sure. Well, I mean, the noise level itself, you have to, you know, nowadays you got to simulate that in practice, right? And everything's got to work. You know, this year we had the uh, player to coach communication devices. But if you watch games this week and right, you see a lot of guys squeezing their helmets, trying to get um, clear communication because that's certainly, it can't be counted on. So what happens next? Everything else has to kick in, your wristbands, your signals, your other methods of communication. So that's been a part of our process, which we've worked really, really hard to make airtight in every regard. And, uh, and then you have to simulate the noise itself, you know, where you really, you know, you know it's a loud place. They do a great job with the game day atmosphere. Um, in terms of the opponent itself, it's the most important part. Uh, not only your service teams, but also when you go good on good. It has to continue to be an iron sharp, sharpens iron mentality. Your good players have to challenge each other. We've got to see speed on speed all week long at the beginning, the middle, and the end of practice. When you put all those things together, we feel it's always been a good recipe for preparation. What do you, what do you know now? What do you know in January about this group? About our group? Well, it's... It's, we've sandwiched, right, the different um, classes, because the different class types, right? We have a, our first signee class, you know, a first full cycle class, I should say. They were freshmen last year. A significant amount of them played, almost the most in the country. And now they're sophomores, so they have experience, you know? They might not be veterans, but they have experience. And then you have um, a good contingent of guys that have been here three, four, and five years that I've really worked hard and seen some ups and downs and have been just itching and grinding to be really, really good in a win. And then you have some portal classes, uh, particularly this last one of some really highly talented, high caliber, high care factor guys that can, that can be impactful and that made essentially seamless transitions, as seamless as you can make them, you know, especially as it relates to the timing of their arrival, right? Some guys got here in January some at the end of the summer, some at the end of the spring. So I think all in all, what, uh, what I've learned is that, um, I guess I relearned that it's all about people, right? Hardworking people that are good people that have high care factors, they're gonna find a way to make it work. I'm, uh, I'm beyond words excited to watch this group play ball. Mario, right, thinking back to last year, it seems like one of the hinge points of the season was the uh, end of the game against Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. um, you say you evaluate everything at every, all the time. Is there any, any changes you made to end of game management or, uh, you know, set process? Well, the first one is follow process. We had a process in place. We just didn't follow it. We've also added um, um, a time management coach to always just over harp on the situation. Again, we had it in place. We didn't follow process, which is the most important part. But we certainly cranked up the intensity and the organization behind it. Who is the time management coach? We don't. <laughs> 
Coach, a lot is always kind of said about SEC in the trenches, offensive line, defensive line. You yourself were part of Alabama for a long time, kind of know that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, what are your thoughts on where are your guys comparing the trenches to other programs around the country on the offensive side and defensive side? Well, that's for people to decide at the end of the year. You know, I don't, I think preseason awards are, um, I don't know how much meaning they have, how much value they have. You know, you see a lot of nominations and this person's preseason, this and that, but, you know, football is not going to be one on paper. It's going to be one on the field. We've taken a lot of pride in building a, a, a group of trench players that are explosive, that are strong, that have good balance and body control, that are tough minded and hardworking, um, and that really aren't very concerned about praise. They just they want to get better. They want to impact the game the best way they can. They know their role. They're really good leaders, uh, and they strive to be the very best in the country. You know, but they certainly don't proclaim it. Or, um, you know, it's they're more about the work and finding a way to get it done. Coached in the SEC, do you feel like SEC body types are a thing? And what type of challenge does that pose? I think program body types are a thing. You know, coached in very in different conferences and, you know, I've had an Outland Trophy winner in the Pac-12, had an Outland Trophy winner and Remington winner in the SEC. And we've had both here at the University of Miami as well. So. I think it's more team related than it is conference related. I think it's philosophical as well. You know, what kind of program do you want to have? We've always been about the trenches. We've just um, added that other component about having some explosive skilled players around it now. So we're inching closer and closer to the type of roster we want to have. I said that one player obviously doesn't make a difference always in the game, but the quarterbacks in this game have experience. They've been around for a while. How much do you think that'll be a factor? The experience for each guy in this matchup, in this particular game? Well, I mean, enough, uh, not enough can be said about their quarterback. I mean, um, I think statistically he, he leads the country in accuracy when under pressure. Uh, certainly his touchdown to interception ratio lends you to, to understand how accurate, how decisive, what kind of the caliber of decisions he makes. I mean, he's on point. He's a very well-coached player. He's a very smart player, but he's also – Elusive, he's got great feet, great body uh, control. He's, he's got great awareness in the pocket. Um, and he's, he's a winner, you know? And I think uh, now going into his second year in the system, you know, certainly a guy that, uh, that you have to control throughout the course of the game. Cam Ward has been at different places and every place he's been, he's just gotten better and better and better. And sometimes he's been playing from ahead and sometimes from behind, but he just plays and he plays at an extremely high level. Um, and he's done that since the day he got here. Um, there's no limitations as it relates to install and game plan, as it relates to him. Sometimes you got to slow it down so that everybody gets it. But I think a quarterback like him, um, he's so focused and concerned about the team doing well that he's willing to do whatever it takes to make the team do well. So all in all, a winner, an alpha, a leader. So he'll, he'll have a massive impact on us. I want to go back to the, communicate, the new communication rule. Because um, you're right, every game that you watch Saturday, whether it was a neutral side in Ireland or whatever, quarterbacks were covering the, covering the heroes like crazy. Is, is this something coaches wanted? Is it, I mean, it, because it's, some, it's, it's a new toy, which is nice. Everybody likes a new toy, but you know, you got to figure it out kind of on the fly, and it seems like it could be more, more, help, more, more harm than help. Well, we're going to find out. out. You know, we're going to find out in a hurry. But I think a lot of people wanted it. Um, and there was a very strong contingent of those that didn't want it, that really rely heavily on their hand signals and tempo and whatnot. And they feel they get slowed down by that process. And they got to get used to that cutoff. And what do you say right before the cutoff that you can't change after the cutoff? Can you get a hold of a guy? And now you got to keep track of green dots. If you have two on the field, it's a penalty. So there's a lot of things that go with this. Uh, in conjunction with this, you also have that technology on the sideline, the use of tablets, which had never been used before. So there's a lot, and um, as long as it's used the right way, efficiently, as long as the, the information is presented with clarity, it's a bonus. You know, if it's unorganized and jumbled, then you could create your own issues as well. Two-minute timeout, which we can't say two-minute warning. Right. For whatever, whatever. Um, to change strategy in, in any way, or is it just you think about it? It does well. You do and you don't because you know there's a 40 second play clock, and you got to take that into account as you head towards that two minute warning. Not to mention the NFL. I mean, the clock still winds, you know, after the two minute warning, regardless of first down or playing it. So 
there's uh, certainly a lot of similarities. I think um, I know we have. I'm sure everybody has done a lot of studies and meeting and network opportunities with the NFL and some of their two minute, you know, time management situations and people and mechanisms and whatnot. And, and we feel strongly about the things we've worked on. You know, the situational football that we've certainly uh, focused on and emphasized, and, and we certainly got a lot of work on it during camp. And, and looking forward to you know taking advantage of some opportunities to come our way. Back to the trenches and sandwiching with Portland, one of the three D tackles that you guys have, <coughs> Simeon, CJ, and Marley, just the value that they can bring with their experience and being able to help you guys and help you guys on the, on the front. Absolutely, it's such a hard position to develop, and you know it's probably one of the biggest areas of need that we had here at Miami uh, for for a bit now. And when guys have experience, when they're seasoned, they understand. And they feel those double teams, the bump blocks, the reach blocks, the back blocks, all that stuff. They're able to, you know, read splits and stances and understand backfield sets. Uh, they communicate better. They understand the urgency of completing an assignment as it relates to just gap responsibilities and whatnot. So those guys are, they're hard workers. They're really tough, which we love. And they all have high motors and they're really competitive. So they've been great mentors for the young guys. You certainly see our young guys improving because of the type of leadership these guys are displaying. How do you feel about the team's health coming out of camp and were there any significant injuries in camp? Yeah, I feel good. We all feel good about our health in camp. I don't you know if we had a significant injury, we certainly wouldn't share it at this time. Um, and I wouldn't and I don't mean any um, disrespect out of that. But uh, I can honestly say that we feel very good about our health coming out of camp. You talked about classes kind of sandwiching together, all coming together. Mm-hmm. Culture-wise, do you think the program is where it needs to be to be a successful program around the country? It's getting there, you know, and it's getting there because I think the caliber of human being, the caliber of competitor and care factor, you know, it. Uh, a lot of it starts and ends with what you are when you're away from the building and when you, when you start cranking out successive highest GPAs in team history and you're – you know, we've always done really well with community service, but uh, to, again, just knock those numbers out and then to see time invested um, with the younger players, time invested with each other, just finding ways to um, improve relationships and connection. You know, um, the best thing in the world is getting, you know, for football, I believe, is getting a lot of like-minded people together because when they're like-minded and they're, they're high-achieving, they're, they're strong alpha personality types, they're going to compete. They're going to try to knock each other out in practice, but they're going to want to get better. And uh, we've gotten better in that regard. Are we all the way there? I mean, that's to be determined on the field. Do we feel good about it? Absolutely. I think coaches get some form of this question before they go their careers. I apologize, but you're going to know more about fan, Ball State, and whoever the fourth game is, because you'll have them. How, how do coaches not go crazy about all the unknowns in week one? Because how do they not go crazy? Or, or to what level of crazy do they actually get to? Probably better, right? Um, you know, if you work hard enough, um, if you dig deep enough into preparation and you make sure that you are doing that and impacting the people around you as you prepare, and you're airtight in terms of your rules and your processes, that has to be good enough. The rest, right, you know, is game day, making it happen. And the biggest thing is when you get into a game like this, you've done all the work, right? You've had all these practices, you've installed the plays you feel great about and whatnot, but you want to make sure that while all that's being done, that there's trust and confidence in the players and in each other. Eliminate anxiety, right? Anxiety is maybe the biggest performance killer there is out there. And when you prepare the right way, you know, we've had some great speakers. We've had some great alumni stop by, and they talk about it all the time. And you got to be able to put your head at night with confidence because you did the work, not because you talk yourself into feeling good because of the work. Well, that said, how much are you a believer in tone setting the first game? Obviously, whether you play a lesser opponent or go on the road to Florida, you want to win that game, but how much do you believe in the setting the tone for the season, how important a game like this is? I think you set the tone week to week. I've always believed that. And I say that because I'm I wanna let's not let's put this game aside for one second. You go to any year and you go out and you play a great game, um, and you do well, but the next week you don't. Well, that first game is quickly forgotten. You're back to square one. So it's square one every single week. 
you know, the one and no mentality has permeated college football and really all sports because everyone is really understanding more and more the importance of being where your feet are right now. Don't allow yourself to drift, you know, and, and just get ahead of yourself because typically when you do, you're just not seeing all the the bumps in the road in front of you. So we stay very um, grounded in our approach to our opponent. Sorry, I wanted to ask you about Root. Uh, when a kid comes in and has a lot of success quickly, you can go one of two ways. Either he says, I'm good, and stays there, or he looks in the mirror and says, this is where I can get to. How has he gotten better since the end of last season? In your eyes? Well, I think I'd like to answer that question by saying that it relates to our program's progress. The best thing we could do for Ruben Bain is bring guys like Francis Mainoa and bring in Markel Bell, you know, and Tommy Kinsler, excuse me, and bring in guys that will challenge him on a daily basis at the line of scrimmage. You know, getting Akeem Mesdor healthy, bringing Elijah Alston in, right, Tyler Barron in, bringing Armando Blunt in, bringing guys that are going to just not allow you to get comfortable, you know, because, again, that's great accomplishment, and that was last year. We owe it to Ruben Bain to absolutely push him to the edge to make sure he maximizes his great potential. And uh, he doesn't shy away from that competition. He, uh, he's taken a great step forward in terms of leadership. So we expect him to take another step forward as well in his performance. Brian, you guys face the two other their big three programs in the state this year. How much, if you were to win both of those games, does that make an impression on recruiting around Florida? You know playing those bit high profile teams in the state and potentially beating both of them and showing that you're in a better spot than them. All focus on Florida. What did you say about Coach Napier? You, you coached with him at Alabama for a few years in your relationship and just uh, your, your thoughts on him as a coach. Yeah, hard worker. Really good person. You know, we uh, certainly was a pretty interesting collection of coaches back there and we all took a a ton of pride in our work and working for Coach Saban and, and had a lot of success together. but. Certainly, um, you know, have tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, great family man as well. So, certainly a guy that uh, I have a lot of respect for. Anything else, Coach? All right. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Thank you.